Messenger, Book 9 of the America Falls series. Written by Scott Medbury. Narrated by Adam Barr. I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death, and Hades was following close behind him. Revelation chapter 6, verse 8. 1. The messenger heard them coming from a long way off. They were noisy and careless. The kind of noisy and careless that only comes from supreme confidence. He was hidden in the late afternoon shadows cast by thick scrub to the side of the road. He was there for exactly three minutes and fifty-three seconds before they rounded the bend ahead of him. He knew this because he'd pulled his battered stopwatch from the pocket of his greatcoat and clicked it as soon as he heard them. His mouth was a grim line, barely visible in his rust-colored beard as he peered, unseen, from the bushes. He didn't like the look of them. At first, they looked like marauders. They had the same shaved heads and arrogance. But these four were different in a way he couldn't quite determine in the fading light. All four were armed. The leader had a hunting bow that was slung over his shoulder, and the others carried an assortment of bladed weapons in their belts and slings. He examined them closely as they advanced along the road toward his vantage point. Each sported a tattooed black pattern around their eyes that dripped down their cheeks like tears of old blood. It was then he spied the pentagram carved into the leader's forehead. The messenger didn't need further evidence to understand who they were, but if he had, the shriveled human ears strung around their necks and the sharpened teeth in their mouths would have confirmed it. Cannibals. The bow carrier was their leader, and the shape etched in his forehead, his insignia of rank. He had only ever had two encounters with their kind in all of his travels into the southern reaches of New Hampshire and across the old border into Massachusetts. They were secretive, and when they weren't hidden away, they generally only came out to hunt. The first encounter had ended badly for the two he'd met on the road. The council had ordered that, where possible, their kind should be summarily executed wherever they were encountered, and he was glad to oblige. The second time, he had been traveling at night and had come upon an encampment of them. He had observed them for a few hours and, despite the fact that they'd have moved on in the meantime, reported their position to the council upon his return. He spat in the dirt under the bush. Of all the raggedy, lawless bands of humans that had sprung up after the Chinese had withdrawn to the West, the cannibals were the most objectionable. He watched them receding into the distance and came to a quick decision. He would follow them for a while. He could afford a couple of days, and if he was lucky enough, they would lead him to their lair. If not, he would kill these four himself. A day or two was a small price to pay for such a golden opportunity to locate one of their secret lairs. When they were out of sight, he scrambled silently from his shelter and padded lightly after them. An hour or so later, he crouched in the trees, watching as the cannibals made camp in a clearing by the side of the road. He knew that just over two miles away was a small trading village. It was one of the few that had managed to survive outside of the three cities. It had its own semblance of law, and the people there were poor but content. He had stopped there for supplies many times when traveling in this part of the state, and had been planning to visit the next day. Now he assumed the cannibals were planning to do just that as well. Were they coming for supplies or to cause trouble? He watched them in the darkness. They were silhouetted by the light of a small fire and laughed and talked as one of them pulled meat from a sack and handed it around. He couldn't see what they cooked on the points of the knives they held over the fire, but he knew well enough what it was. Anger licked at him like the flames licking the meat, and he briefly considered killing them right then. It would be easy enough, and certainly satisfying. 
They hadn't set a watch and were preoccupied as they filled their bellies and talked. In the end, the chance of them leading him back to their base was too valuable to waste. Why kill four now when he could have the chance to kill a whole nest of them when he led a raiding party back from the city? He made himself comfortable, crossing his legs and watching them as he pulled a folded cloth from inside his coat. He unwrapped it carefully with one hand and spurned the salted beef. His appetite for meat spoiled. He began to eat the berries and nuts it held instead. Eventually, the cannibals bedded down for the night, and their watcher did the same. He lay down in the shallow dugout he had made and swept the autumn leaves he had collected over his body until only his face was visible in the patchwork of red, gold, and brown. He awoke as the first tendrils of dawn were crawling across the dark sky. He ate more berries as he waited for his quarry to rise. They did, exactly 33 minutes and 43 seconds later. He clicked off his stopwatch. People always asked him why he used the stopwatch. Every second counts, he would say mysteriously. He had no reason, of course. It made no difference to anything. But for some reason, using the stopwatch comforted him and gave him a link to the past. Time was not the same in this new world. It was a relic of a past when people had made it an all-important commodity. Not enough time in the day. Don't waste time. I don't have time. Time flies. All of those phrases that meant something then. They meant nothing now. Now there was nothing but time, and every now and then, he liked to measure it. It had become a habit, like whistling or singing. He waited until his quarry were on the move before breaking cover. They did indeed head to the village, and he was able to follow them at a discreet distance until they entered. He was happy about this. Blending in with the village folk, he would be able to get much closer to them and maybe glean something of their plans. The village was really the remnants of a small New Hampshire town called Pelham. The people were as dirty and unkempt as the town itself, but still, given that its first inhabitants would have been no older than 16 or 17 at the most, it was a testament to the social and resolute nature of human beings. The Chinese genocide had killed off nearly every American man and woman over the age of 16, and when they themselves were forced to flee the eastern states, the invaders had left the survivors to their own devices. Many had perished, but others had come together with varying degrees of success. While this town had developed to a level akin to a Middle Ages village, the city the messenger came from, Manchester, before America's fall, the biggest city in New Hampshire, more closely resembled an early 1900 city. It hadn't been easy to get it to that level, though. The vacuum left by the Chinese allowed several smaller nations to form, some happy to survive, others bent on conquest. It had led to inevitable clashes, and a particularly brutal period was brought to a close by what had become known as the Battle of Concord. A council had been formed by the victors, and it was the dream of that council that one day all of New Hampshire, New York State, and Maine, collectively known as the cities, would be a safe and united place for all. The messenger had been there from the beginning, and that thinking and foresight were the basis of his missions. They called him the messenger, but in fact, he was more like a recruiter, a gatherer of people. He ranged far and wide, and would seek out people with the right attributes and attitudes and tell them of the cities, particularly Manchester, Rochester, and Concord. He would offer them a place, and then move on to find more. Once he had gathered ten recruits, he would lead them back to Manchester, stay a while, and then head out again. He had done that for many years. Of course, some refused, but most to whom he made the offer accepted it, inspired by his stories of hope and promise. In the cities, there was running water, electricity, law and order, rudimentary medical care, work, and a combined standing army of 3,000. 
The messenger's ability to relate to everybody he met and paint a picture of the life that was possible in the cities meant that he had been a major factor in the growth of the population since the original group had settled there ten years before. Looking at the ragged and underfed individuals going about their daily lives as he entered the square of Pelham, it wasn't hard to see why the recruiting part of his job was easy. He rarely recruited anyone from Pelham, though. Their mindsets and patterns of living were too ingrained. Lawlessness was rife here, even with the presence of local law. It wasn't hard to keep up with the cannibals when they entered the town. The unwashed throng opened for them like the sea parting from Moses, and he deliberately slowed in case one should turn and spot him. While the tall, well-fed cannibals could not be mistaken for villagers, he also would be easy to spot as an outsider. The messenger was tall and rangy. Underneath his dark, dusty clothes, he was all lean muscle. His straggly red hair was pulled back from his face in a topknot, and even dirty, was a few shades lighter than the deeper red, almost brown, of his beard. The cannibals surprised him a little. They didn't cause any trouble and seemed focused on perusing the stalls of goods in the main square. Every now and then, he would see them flick a coin and deposit purchased items into a sack one of them carried. After a few minutes, he spotted two men, big for villagers and dressed in what looked to the messenger's eyes to be old state trooper uniforms. Both men carried small clubs. They were marshals, what passed for law in Pelham. They were following the cannibals discreetly, but even from across the square, he could see the apprehension on their faces. And as he was watching, the bigger one cuffed his partner over the ear. Apparently, he needed some encouragement to keep up. It seemed that the cannibals weren't interested in making trouble, so perhaps their fear was unfounded. The messenger began to think that they might even be regular visitors to the village. The people they encountered didn't seem quite as bothered by them as he had expected. He slotted that information into his memory bank, knowing it would be useful to the council if they decided to make an all-out effort to seek out and destroy the cannibals. As they went from stall to stall on the other side of the square, he pretended to examine the wares on his side. Pretended, that is, until he stopped at a stall operated by a woman with one eye. It was a piercing blue, the other an empty pink socket. He focused on the good one. She was cooking skewered chunks of meat on a grill. The aroma of the sizzling meat made his stomach growl. What kind of meat? She smiled at him. She had one good tooth to go with her good eye. She pointed to the long row of kebabs. Dog. Then the other, which consisted only of four. Pig. A cent apiece for dog. More for pig. I'll take two of the pig. Her eyes widened. She barely sold one a day normally and usually shared them with her family. He reached into the pocket of his overcoat and flipped her a dollar coin. Its gold color was a rare sight in the after days, and the woman snatched it out of the air with ninja-like reflexes, whooping like she had won the lottery. Thanks, mister. He forgot about her as he bit into the salty meat. It had been days since he'd had anything but jerky and nuts. He swallowed the tender meat, somewhat doubtful it was actually pork, but it didn't matter. He could almost feel his energy levels rising with each bite. When he had stripped both skewers to the wood, he dropped them in the mud and turned to find the cannibals again. They were nowhere to be seen. Two. The fair-haired eleven-year-old followed his father from stall to stall as they filled their barrow with supplies that would hopefully help them see out the winter. Cain Rand was tall for his age, footsore from their trek, but excited to be on his first expedition to the village. His dad had always promised he could accompany him when he turned twelve, but his mom had sided with the boy this fall, pointing out rightly that he was big enough to help bring back more goods 
and perhaps eliminate the need for another midwinter expedition. You nearly got yourself killed the last time you had to go out in the snow, she had pointed out. He's eager for it. Just take him along, Daniel, please. They had argued for days, but eventually she had worn his father down. Father and son had set out before dawn that day, more than six hours before. Those hours walking were an eternity to an eleven-year-old, the monotony only broken by the stories his father told of the before days. The trip back would seem even longer when their barrow and their backpacks were chock full. Cain felt the weight in his pack growing heavier with each item his father put in it. He began to regret his eagerness. Still, when they had arrived three hours before, he had been imbued with a new energy. The sights and the sounds of the village had assaulted his senses, but they didn't bother him like his father had warned. They merely flavored his excitement at this new, wonderful experience. What had astounded him, though, were the people. Cain could count on both hands the number of fellow human beings he had seen in his whole life, his own family of six and his grandpa, may he rest in peace. Now, here he was among hundreds of them, people of all sorts, and he didn't stop gawking until his father had given him a gentle smack across the ear. Don't stare. It's rude. After that, he had been more circumspect when he was looking at those around him, but was still inclined to stare if he saw someone that interested him. They filled their barrow with vegetables, dried fruit, salted meat, and various utensils that his father thought would be useful, and by the time they were done, they had nearly spent all the coin they had brought with them. I'll have to go out on another treasure hunt before the winter sets in, Daniel Rand said to his son. They were eating a lunch of meat on a stick, bought for a cent apiece from the same one-eyed woman who had recently served the messenger. I might take you with me. That would be awesome, Dad, Kane said happily. He didn't get to eat much meat at home, and his mouth watered as he ate the salty, fatty morsels. A treasure hunt was what his dad called his bi-yearly raids for coins into the houses of the abandoned estate where they had made their home. Kane had overheard his dad telling his mom that there was only one more block left for him to scout, and that sooner rather than later he would have to go further afield. His dad smiled at him and took the last bite of his meat before ruffling Kane's hair and standing up. Come on, we just have to get a treat for your mom and the other kids. Then we can head home. Every fall expedition was marked by his father bringing home treats, gifts for everyone in the family. Kane's most prized possession, a pack of playing cards, had been given to him the previous fall. He was eager to see what they could find for the others. He stood up and froze. His father's face had gone as white as a fresh snowfall. Cain followed his gaze, curious to see what had spooked him. His eyes fell on four sinister-looking men in black. They stood at the vegetable stall that Cain and his father had visited just before lunch. They looked creepy. They had tattooed black circles that ran down their cheeks like tears of black oil. As he stared, one of the men laughed at something the stallkeeper had said. Cain was horrified when the laugh revealed a mouth full of pointed teeth, like those of the shark in his sister's Creatures of the Sea picture book. Come on, his dad whispered harshly, grabbing his arm. He pulled Cain close and moved to shield him, but not before the laughing one turned and looked directly at him. The boy, well-fed and groomed unlike the other urchins in the town, stared at the man over his shoulder. The grinning man's tongue ran over his serrated teeth. The eleven-year-old's fascination turned to fright. His father went to the front of the barrow and picked up the long arms and lifted it taking off so fast that Kane had to run to keep up. The timber contraption with large bike wheels was like a cart with two large arms so that a person could lift and pull it along like a rickshaw. The boy was surprised when his father turned in a wide circle and passed all of the stalls and headed for the open end of the square. Dad, what about the treats? 
Forget the treats. It's time to go. Come on, keep up. Kane wasn't stupid, and even though he was disappointed, he could tell the men with the sharp teeth had spooked his dad. He had questions, but somehow his father's urgency, the tone of his voice, told him that now was not the time to ask them. As they made their exit from the square, Kane looked over his shoulder one last time. The eyes of the man who had licked his lips were still on him, and so were those of his comrades. Why were they looking at him? The boy began to feel genuine fear. Three. The messenger scanned the crowd. He cursed under his breath and walked purposefully across the square to the two marshals. They both stood up straighter as the big man approached. What can we do for you, stranger? The stockier one asked, using his club to scratch his stubbly chin. The messenger was in no mood to play games. The cannibals you were watching, where did they go? The marshal weighed up the red-bearded man and then spat on the ground. Gone in good riddance to those demon bastards. Yeah, said the younger man. Good thing, too, we were going to chase them out in another few minutes. The messenger ignored the lie. How long ago and which way? He asked the older man. The man looked him up and down and snorted. Believe me, mister, someone like you does not want to f with them, or you might find yourself being served for... In a blur of movement, the red-bearded man shoved the young marshal onto his backside and pinned the bigger man against the wall. His lower arm pressed hard against his throat, his hook glinting an unspoken threat. Oh, but I do want to f with them, he whispered into the man's face. The young marshal climbed to his feet and rushed at the man holding his partner. In a move that was almost unfairly quick, the messenger stripped the club from the hand of the marshal he had trapped and swung it at the temple of the other. The younger man didn't even groan as his momentum carried him unconscious and face first into the mud. The older man put his hands up in surrender. Please, he said, in a choked voice and pointed a shaky finger to the northern end of the square. They went that way, less than five minutes ago. Thank you, said the stranger politely, removing his arm from the man's throat before handing him back his club. He gestured at the man still face down in the mud. You better turn him over before he suffocates. Later, dude. The messenger ignored the stares that followed him as he strode out of the square. The axe strapped over his shoulders, a stark warning to anyone thinking of intervening or pursuing him. He cursed his meat-greedy sloppiness back in the square. There was no place for ill discipline in this world. He left that for the people back in the cities. He quickened his pace when he was out of the town and reached the top of the first hill quickly. The two-lane road sloped gently down for a mile and then rose again into a second hill. The four cannibals were just beginning to ascend the second hill, and further on he saw two more figures with a cart or something similar, near the top and about to disappear over the rise. He reached his right arm across his body into the pocket of his greatcoat and pulled out a pair of small binoculars. He put them to his eyes and zoomed in on the cannibals. They were cavorting and dancing like idiots as they unhurriedly climbed the hill. Even from that distance, he could hear the faint sounds of their scornful mocking. He scanned the binoculars up the hill, and his gaze came to rest upon the two that the cannibals were following. The bigger figure was pulling a laden cart, forging up the hill as the smaller figure, a boy of twelve or so, pushed from behind. A father and son too well-fed for villagers, which perhaps explained why the cannibals were pursuing them. He watched the two for a few seconds until they disappeared from sight. Their stalkers howled and continued up the hill. The stranger pocketed the binoculars and began down the hill. He didn't bother to stay out of sight now. It would be better if the cannibals spotted him and left off their pursuit. He had dismissed his original objective of following them back to their lair. He now decided to kill them and be done with it. Four. 
The road flattened out again for half a mile before rising gently to another hill. Daniel Rand picked up speed, taking advantage of the level road while he could. Stop pushing now, Kane. He panted over his shoulder. Come up beside me. Kane was tired, but adrenaline triggered by the bloodthirsty shrieks of the men behind them helped him catch up and keep pace with his father. Drop your backpack while we run. But Dad, what about- Just do it, son. Kane shrugged off the heavy pack and let it drop to the road where the contents, bags of nuts and dried fruit, spilled onto the tarmac. Good. Now see the next hill? Yes, Dad. When we get to the top, the road curves to the right and heads back home. I want you to run ahead as fast as you can and follow it. You need to get home to Mom. If you hear them gaining on you before you get there, hide in the trees and wait until you're sure they're gone. What about you, Dad? Don't worry about me, boy. I'll be fine. You just get home to your mother in case... in case I'm delayed. Okay, Dad. It wasn't okay. Kane was scared. He had never seen his father like this and knew something had to be seriously wrong for him to be sent on alone. The four men topped the rise about three minutes behind them and whooped even louder. Don't run, little piggies, one of them called. The road began to slope upwards, and his father ordered Cain to push again. He looked at the men in the distance as he ran to the back of the barrow. Before he put all his strength into pushing the cart forward, the boy stuck up his middle finger at them. His defiant gesture was met with gleeful derision and some yelling, but he didn't catch any of the words, except for eat and heart. They made the top of the incline, and his father stopped, dropping the cart so that it rested on its prop. His chest was heaving as he leaned over, hands on thighs, and tried to catch his wind. Cain did the same. Finally, his dad stretched to his full height, shaking his arms and trying to get blood flowing to his fingers again. Run now, Cain. Run home, and don't stop or look back, he ordered breathlessly. He then reached into the cart and pulled out his machete. But, Dad... I said go. His father hugged him briefly, and a sob escaped Cain's throat. He saw the tears in his father's eyes. Go, his father yelled, turning him away before shoving him in the back. Cain was propelled forward and barely kept his feet as his stumble straightened into a sprint. He followed the faded white lines in the middle of the road, and as his father had ordered, didn't look back, not even as he rounded the bend and disappeared from sight. Daniel Rand ignored the whoops and screams of the cannibals. His normally pleasant and open face was grim. He was resigned to the fact that he would probably die here, and his task now was to delay the cannibals as long as possible. It was a shame he didn't have his shotgun. Firearms were a rarity nowadays, and he was pretty sure that the cannibals didn't have one. It certainly would have evened the odds a little. No. In the end, it was better left at home in case Tracy needed it to protect the kids while he was away. He blinked away the bitter tears evoked by the thought of his wife and children. Come on, you dirty f***s! He screamed down the slope at the cannibals. The four men had slowed when they saw he meant to make a stand. Oh, we're coming all right, Daddy, said the tall man leading the cannibals. Now they were closer, Daniel could see the inverted cross carved into the skin of the leader's forehead. Where has your sweet meat of a boy gone? Did you send him to hide? Never you mind about him, he yelled at them as they closed to within thirty feet. He waved his machete to emphasize a point. You worry about me. Oh, come on, where is he? I haven't seen one as fat as him for a long time. Do you have more at home? Fuck you, asshole, the man yelled and grabbed the handles of the cart. He hoisted it with an almighty heave, pushed it down the hill at his tormentors. 
As soon as it was away and careening down the hill, he turned and ran. The harsh laughter of the cannibals rang out behind him, followed a few seconds later by some curses, but alas, no screams. The messenger crested the hill behind them and ducked to the ground, just in time to observe the cannibals jumping out of the path of the driverless cart. Two of them only just managed to avoid it and climbed to their feet to the raucous amusement of their fellows. All four paused to track the progress of the cart as it broke up and finally collapsed in an explosion of timber and goods at the bottom of the hill. Finally, they turned, the leader unslinging his hunting bow and sprinting after their quarry, the others following closely behind. The messenger rose and found his feet. They were still three quarters of a mile ahead of him, and he didn't waste any more time. He loped after them, the hunter hunting the hunters. Daniel ran, sprinted along the road, but ran straight ahead when he reached the bend. He leapt into the waist-high grass that separated the old road from the forest and ran for the trees. The hoots and hollers behind him were much closer now and sent a fresh jolt of adrenaline through his system. He would need that adrenaline and more, a fact that was punctuated by the loud thunk of an arrow striking the trunk of a tree just inches to his right. He ducked and weaved and swerved as he ran into the shadows and dared to think that he would be able to lead them a long way off Kane's trail. It was an illusion. Something struck him in the back, just under the right shoulder blade, so hard that it picked him up off his feet and propelled him face first into the carpet of pine needles. Daniel groaned as he came to rest. The piercing pain in his back was agonizing, and his breath whistled with each inhalation. He tried to rise to his hands and knees, but his right arm was rendered useless by the arrow in his shoulder. His left hand scrabbled desperately through layers of pine needles before he found purchase on the ground beneath and was able to half-crawl, half-drag himself to a bush a few feet away. Every inch of that short journey was a new experience in agony. He finally settled under the leafy bush, struggling to breathe and held the machete in a white-knuckled grip as he waited for death to arrive. Here, piggy, 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 called the leader. Come out, come out, wherever you are. You sure you got him, Logan? Asked another, only to earn a cuff over the ear. Shut up, he whispered harshly. Of course I got him. Spread out and make sure you're looking at the ground. If he's not dead, he'll be bleeding all over the place. It was Logan, the leader, who found him. Over here. The other three joined him within seconds, and he pointed out the blood-smeared trail through the pine needles. He walked on ahead, following the scuff marks until they reached a large shrub. He put his finger over his lips to shush his mates. Over the sounds of the forest, he could hear a faint, irregular whistling sound, the sound of a pierced lung. He smiled. Lind, pull him out, he ordered the one he had just cuffed. Lind, the stoutest of the four thugs and none too intelligent looking, went to the bush and kneeled to peer under it. He gave a snort of triumph and reached in to grab the booted foot closest to him. There was a violent rustle of leaves and with a howl the cannibal jerked his arm back and looked down dumbly at the three bloody stumps that were so recently the fingers of his hand. K he shrieked, cradling his ruined hand as tears streamed from his eyes. Look what he did to my hand! Shit, yelled the leader, looking at the sky for strength. He savagely pushed his wounded comrade onto the ground, took a step forward and knocked another arrow, shooting it point-blank into the thick bush. He was rewarded with a yelp of pain. Useless. He bent over and screamed at the sobbing and bleeding Lind before turning to the others. Don't just stand there. Get him out of there. The other two drew their knives and were more cautious as they pulled the moaning man from his hiding place. The second arrow had gone through his right hip. The protruding tip left a bloody furrow in the forest floor as they dragged him into the center of the clearing. The fight had gone out of him. Blood bubbled on his lips with every whistling breath. 
and his eyelids fluttered as he fought to stay conscious. The leader dropped beside him and roughly tilted him onto his side and began pulling the first arrow from his back. He did it slowly, relishing the gargling scream it produced. When it was free, he let the man fall back onto his back and held the bloody point in front of his eyes. This is the same arrow I will use to bring your boy down. I'll make sure it doesn't kill him, though, because I want to skin him alive. The meat tastes so much better that way. Daniel's pale face contorted in pain, and he said something softly. The leader bent over him. Was that? He asked cheerfully. I can't hear you, Daddy. I said, fuck you. The dying man lunged up at the cannibal, his open mouth finding his tormentor's ear and biting down hard. The cannibal flinched, but too late. Daniel jerked his head, ripping the organ away like a dog pulling muscle from a bone. He then fell back and with the last of his strength, spat the ear into the dirt. Now it was Logan's turn to scream, and he clapped his hand over the shredded flesh, the warm blood pouring through his fingers. You f He spat with barely concealed fury as he pulled his hand away and looked at it. Logan rose to his feet, and Lind, his injury momentarily forgotten as self-preservation kicked in, shuffled quickly out of his leader's reach. His two cronies had already moved a safe distance away. The leader ignored them and pulled a knife with a long, thin blade from his belt and bent over the dying man. Your boy, he said almost conversationally, as he sliced off the dying man's ears, one at a time with two economical movements, is going to suffer for days and days before I put an end to him. But before he does, I will starve him until he begs me to eat these. He waved the fleshy offering in front of his victim's eyes, but only received the choked gargling in response. The leader placed the ears into a pouch on his belt and then bared his sharpened teeth in a terrible smile before placing a steadying hand under the man's head and driving the long, thin blade slowly and deliberately into his eye. He kept pushing until the blade hit the back of his victim's skull. Daniel's body stiffened, a ragged final sigh escaping his lips. Logan withdrew the blade, wiped it on his sleeve, and sprang to his feet. Come on, the leader said. Let's go hunting. The two uninjured cannibals fell in behind their leader immediately, but Lynn took the opportunity to viciously kick the dead man in the head several times before turning and running after his mates. Five. The messenger reached the long grass and availed himself of the cover it offered, crouching and moving forward, well to the left of where the cannibals and their quarry had trampled it. He heard screaming and shouting from the trees, but had difficulty telling how far in they might be. The noises subsided after a while, and he decided to enter the forest, planning to circle around and fall upon them from the front. He was running for the tree line when the leader, the side of his head a red mess, burst from the forest barely twenty feet away. The messenger ducked down in the grass, watching as three of them emerged. He had begun to think the father may have taken down the fourth, when he also appeared a good few seconds behind his companions. He waited until they were on their way and then, resigned to the fact that he was too late, quickly ran into the trees the way they had come. It wasn't hard to follow their trail as he ran through the dappled sunlight. He inspected the floor of the forest, trying to piece together what had happened. There was no evidence of a child's passing, and it led him to believe that the father had tried to lead his pursuers away, perhaps hoping to give his son time to escape. The more he considered it, the more he believed he was right. If not, the bastards would still be at their butchery. He found the mutilated body of the man a few seconds later. There was no point checking for a pulse. 
there was no sign of the boy. With his suspicions confirmed, he turned on his heel and began his own pursuit. Kane ran on, his chest heaving. It had been an hour since his father had ordered him to go, and the fear and adrenaline that had fueled him initially was finally fading. He was nearing the end of his endurance. He had just passed a tall tree that his dad had called Big Red as they passed it on the way to the village that morning. The happy, carefree walk that had held such promise for the eleven-year-old seemed days ago, not hours. He slackened his pace to a walk. The tree meant he was less than an hour from home, and there had been no sign of the bad men. Cain even considered stopping to wait for his dad. He was sure by now that he had dealt with the problem, but decided the risk of catching an ass-whooping for disobeying orders wasn't worth it. His dad had been very serious about it. Every now and then, he would turn and look back along the road, hoping to see his father in the distance. He had been disappointed each time. A half hour after he passed Big Red, he looked back and a feeling of joy swept over him. In the distance, through the shimmering heat of the blacktop, he could see the figure of his father. He waved and called out, Dad! The figure waved back, and Cain began to run towards him. He ran hard, the happiness fueling his fatigued body. He ran for a couple of hundred feet, until the shimmering figures suddenly morphed into two. Cain, confused, slowed to a walk. Who was that with his dad? A little closer, and then the two turned into four, and he stopped in shock. The bad men. The tallest of the figures waved again, and he heard a distant call. Piggy! Terror struck the boy, and sobbing, he turned and ran. Dad, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? He half cried, half chanted, as he ran for his life. The leader cackled as the boy turned and fled. They slowed to a jog. Now that the boy was in sight, he was content to let him run ahead and lead them to his home. Hopefully there were fat little brothers and sisters and a nice, plump mommy waiting. Such a treat might make losing an ear and all the pain worth it. The moaning behind him soured his good mood. Lynn, he snapped over his shoulder. Stop your mewling and keep up or I will put a knife through your eye too. The messenger followed the gang. He had also spotted the boy ahead of them and had kept up his speed as they had slowed theirs. He had again entered the trees to the side of the road and closed the gap between them slowly but surely. His plan was to take out the injured one at the back first. He was well behind the others, and a throwing knife would be quick and quiet. If luck was on his side, they would be unaware of their comrade's demise for a while allowing him time to get ahead of them and launch an attack from the front when they turned to investigate. Five minutes later, he decided it was time. Still in the tree line, he was now tracking parallel to the man at the tail as the road veered closer to the trees. He pulled one of the black, flat-bladed knives from his belt and hefted it in his hand without taking his eyes off his mark. He pulled slightly ahead and then halted, barely fifteen feet away from his target. He waited until the man was forward of him, then cocked his right hand over his shoulder and tensed. Go! The shout of the leader surprised their stalker, and when all four of the cannibals took off at a run, he cursed under his breath. The messenger darted out of the trees. A quarter mile further on, he saw the overgrown brick entrance of a housing estate. The cannibals were now running for it. The kid had disappeared in there, and they didn't want to lose him. He sprinted after them. Sunnyside Springs, with an N and an R missing, the weathered letters over the entrance announced. He ran up the long, sweeping road and curved to the left, passing the first overgrown yards in their dilapidated, once-proud homes. Ahead, the cannibals turned a corner. 
He pursued them, still carrying the throwing knife he had drawn just minutes before. Cain sprinted as hard as he could, but the men were gaining on him. Try as he might, he couldn't get far enough ahead to get out of their line of sight, something that might have allowed him to lose them with a few quick turns. He sobbed as the pounding footsteps closed in on him. Six. After passing the gates into Sunnyside, the cannibals had managed to close the gap enough to take the kid with a short burst. Logan didn't want that. Not yet, anyway. Hell, if it was only about the boy, he could have brought him down with an arrow a mile back. No. After the pain his father had caused, Logan was hell-bent on finding the rest of his family and inflicting some pain of his own. As such, he was more than happy to stick close enough to scare the bejesus out of the kid and ensure they didn't lose him in the maze of houses. Cain managed to outrun them without it ever occurring to him that they were allowing him to do just that. Finally, after many twists and turns, with his lungs and legs burning, he tore onto the street that led to his home. He ran for the barricade of old cars, metal, and wire that his dad had constructed at the end of their cul-de-sac and climbed over it like a monkey, avoiding the metal points and barbed wire with ease before scrambling down the other side. He didn't waste time looking back. He sprinted up the hill towards his home, screaming to his mother. Kane's mother, her thin blonde hair in a ponytail, bent over the sink scrubbing dishes as she listened to her other children playing in the backyard. At first glance, she would have looked like any housewife from before. However, closer inspection would have shown her to be thinner than she should have been. That was a consequence of always making sure that the kids and Daniel always had full bellies. Sometimes that meant she went without. That's just the way it was. Her jeans and threadbare shirt hung loosely on her frame, and when she smiled at a particularly boisterous laugh from one of her children, a missing front tooth marred the pale prettiness of her face. She was young, perhaps only 26 or 27, but her face was careworn. Tracy Rand blew a strand of hair from her brow as she glanced through the curtains. The three children were wrestling on the grass under the kitchen window, eight-year-old Rachel getting the better of her younger siblings. Don't be too rough, you kids, she called out, putting the last of the dishes onto the rack to dry. She wiped her hands on a faded towel and walked upstairs to her bedroom. The house was clean and sparsely furnished. They had found it seven years ago after Daniel's father, one of the few original adult survivors of the Pyongyang flu, had died. Daniel hadn't wanted to stay in their old apartment after that. Too many memories, too many gangs in the city, too much danger. He had wanted to give her and Kane and any more kids they might have a fresh start. She didn't mind. She would have followed him to the ends of the earth. Daniel's parents had purchased a house in Sunnyside Springs during the fall of that year, the year that everything had gone to hell. They, along with the ten-year-old Daniel, had been scheduled to move in the weekend after Christmas. The flu and subsequent invasion meant it never happened. Daniel's mother had died on Christmas night, and they had bunkered down in their old apartment to ride out Armageddon. His father had done a good job of keeping Daniel safe in the years that followed. He had been a Marine, and his skills and weapons training had stood him in good stead during the invasion, and as the remnants of American society crumbled into chaos afterwards. A year and a half after it all went to hell, Daniel's father had found Tracy cowering from a pack of dogs and had rescued her, taking her back to live with them. They had lived together, one small, happy family, until the two kids fell for each other in their mid-teens. Little Cain was the byproduct of their union. Daniel's father had been angry, beyond angry. What sort of life is a kid gonna have in this shitty world? But when he laid eyes on little Cain, he fell in love with his grandson. Cain had been four when his grandfather died suddenly. 
He just dropped dead one morning as he was cleaning the breakfast dishes. Perfectly fine one minute, face down on the floor the next. He had survived the Pyongyang flu, the Chinese occupation, and numerous scrapes and battles since, only to be brought down by a stroke in his own kitchen. Life was unjust. Not long after that, the family of three had packed up their things and left, making the 14-mile journey to their new home. The home they settled upon was a big brick double-story house at the top of a cul-de-sac, as far from the entrance to the estate as they could get. They had made it their very own in the first few months, Daniel scrounging furniture from the houses around them until it was furnished just as she wanted. Tracy sat in front of her dresser and began to brush her hair out. Daniel would be home soon, and she wanted to look pretty for him. She was excited to hear how Kane had gone on his first excursion, too. She never allowed herself to consider the possibility that they wouldn't come back. Daniel was the strongest man she had ever known, even stronger than his father. She didn't worry too much when he was gone. The house was fortified. The downstairs windows and doors were boarded up and reinforced, and the only way in or out was through the sliding door at the back of the house. That had been reinforced with sheet metal and would take some breaking down. If it did happen to fail or they were pursued inside before it could be secured, they could retreat to the second floor where Daniel had constructed a movable barricade of scrap metal and barbed wire at the top of the stairs. That day, trouble was the last thing on her mind. It had been so long since they had even seen a person within miles of the house that Tracy tended to relax almost completely during daylight hours. Of course, Daniel always pestered her about being more vigilant, but then he wasn't the one who had to be cooped up with four screaming kids all on his own. As she pulled the brush through her hair, she daydreamed about the surprise she would give Daniel that night after the kids were in bed. Mom! Damn kids, she thought. All I want is a few minutes of peace. She began another brush stroke, but froze when she worked out that the distressed voice was coming from down the hill, not the backyard. It's Kane. She shot to her feet and snatched up the shotgun standing against the wall beside the dresser. She took the stairs, two at a time, nearly losing her footing halfway down. At the front window, she peeked through a spy hole. That was when the shrill scream of her youngest, Susie, cut through her like a scythe through dry grass. She ran to the back of the house and flew through the open door, pumping the shotgun. Seven. The sight that greeted her was almost beyond her comprehension. There were four strangers in her backyard. Men. They were the stuff of nightmares, and she screamed at the sight of them. One, the tallest, balanced on the pile of firewood that was stacked against the back fence. In his hands was a hunting bow. He had knocked an arrow and was pointing it at the grass. The whole side of his head was a mess of blood, and a carved upside-down cross marred the pale skin of his forehead. He smiled, burying his teeth, and then tipped an imaginary hat to her. Cannibals. A man to his right held Cain, his hand clamped over the boy's mouth, effortlessly restraining the struggling 11-year-old. He held a machete by his side. The three smaller children were huddled on the grass at the feet of the other two men. One had a carving knife, and the other, a pale and sweaty creature with a blood-soaked rag around his hand, held a claw hammer over the heads of her precious children. The one holding the carving knife whistled at her. His sharpened teeth exposed in a lecherous grin. Please, don't hurt them. You can take anything you want. Even though she held the shotgun, Tracy knew she was beaten. The fact that Cain was here without Daniel meant that her husband was dead. She kept her tears at bay. She could grieve later. Right now, as hopeless as the situation looked, she had to try and save her children. 
Her mind worked furiously at the problem, but the only two solutions she thought of were not solutions at all. One, she could try blasting them away, and might manage to take out one or two of them before she was killed, but that would leave the kids alone with the remaining freaks. The second was to kill the children herself, to spare them whatever torture the bastards had in mind. She remembered Daniel once saying to her that he would kill them all before he'd let them fall into the hands of anyone in this savage world. Now, here she was in just that predicament. But it wasn't so cut and dried. At best, she would only be able to kill one or perhaps two of them before she was cut down herself, again, leaving the surviving kids at the mercy of the cannibals. No, for now... It was best to try and reason with them. Please, she said to the one on the woodpile. She had seen the others looking to him and made the correct assumption that he was calling the shots. He laughed at her, and the others joined in, all except the one with the bandaged hand. I won't hurt them, pretty one. One quick nick on the neck and your little sweetmeats will bleed out nice and quiet. All except your oldest boy, unfortunately. Thanks to your dead f***ing husband, I have to make him suffer. Yeah, spat the bloody-handed one in agreement. Cain began to cry. Until that moment, he had still expected his father to come and save them from the bad men. Tracy's vision darkened and she swayed dangerously before regaining control of herself. Confirmation that Daniel was dead, and the fact that they would kill the children regardless of how much she pleaded, changed things. There would be no bargaining with these men. No mercy. She took matters into her own hands, and without saying a word, ran at the cannibal with the injured hand and rammed the barrel of the shotgun into his soft belly. He immediately raised his hands in submission. Don't shoot. Leave my kids alone or this asshole gets it. Tracy screamed at the leader. Logan laughed and jumped lightly to the grass, his bow still aimed at the ground. Tracy half turned so she could see him while keeping her gun hard against the belly of the other. He stopped a dozen paces away. In another life and another time, he would have been considered a handsome young man. Now, though, with his teeth filed to points and the bloody, flipped cross carved into his forehead, he was a walking freak show. Do it, the leader shrugged. Shoot him if you want. You'll be doing me a favor. Logan, no, please, the leader ignored the pleas of his comrade. Go on, shoot, he encouraged her. It won't help. Shoot him or don't. Either way, we'll have full bellies tonight. He ran his tongue along the points of his teeth, and Tracy's resolve faded, the muzzle of the gun still in the belly of the whimpering cannibal. Can't do it, huh? Asked the leader, mock empathy in his voice. It's okay. It's hard to kill the first time. Well, we really wanted to be getting back to camp tonight, but I guess we'll be having a sleepover with you and the kids. Tracy couldn't speak, and her hands began to tremble. She was frozen by indecision and fear. The leader looked at the three of her children huddled together on the grass. By the way, do you have a really big saucepan? Tears sprang to Tracy's eyes. He took another step. Put down the gun, Mom. Tracy shook her head. Let me make it easy for you then. Bill? Yes, boss, said the one holding Cain. Put that very sharp blade against his throat. The cannibal obeyed and brought his machete up to the 11-year-old's throat. Tracy began to sob at the sight of the sharpened blade pressing against her son's vulnerable flesh. Mom, I'm going to give you to three to put down the gun. If you don't, he's going to bleed out right here, in front of you and the other 
kids. She sensed the men around her tense as the countdown began. One? Sobs racked Tracy's body. She shook her head and her finger tightened on the trigger. Two? She took a deep breath, blinking rapidly to clear the tears from her eyes. Three? I love you, kids. Before Tracy was able to pull the trigger, there was a muffled groan to her right. The man holding Kane was slowly sinking to his knees, a black object protruding from his left eye. His numb fingers dropped the machete and tried to find purchase on her son's clothing. The boy shrugged off the weight of his erstwhile captor and bent down, quickly snatching up the machete and holding it in front of him. The leader spun around, his hunting bow raised and searching for a target as he backed away towards the house. Tracy saw an opening and acted. Boom! The force of the shotgun blast caused her to lose her footing and fall onto her backside as the bloody-handed man she shot simultaneously flew backwards into the timber fence, his belly a ruined mess. He slid lifelessly down the timber pails, leaving an obscene trail of blood and guts as he went. The children screamed as the other cannibal knelt over them, using them for cover and waving his carving knife wildly this way and that. Tracy clambered to her feet and turned the shotgun towards him. She froze as she felt the cold point of an arrowhead against the side of her neck. Don't move, bitch, the leader said quietly. Drop the shotgun. There were only two cannibals left now, and Tracy, even while knowing the odds were against her, understood that they were better than they had been a minute before. She relaxed her grip on the shotgun and held it out one-handed to show she was complying before dropping it onto the grass. The other cannibal was still panicked and trying to look everywhere at once. Calm down, Joel, his leader snapped. That's right. Calm down, Joel, said a voice behind him. Tracy found herself swung around violently as the leader positioned her between him and the man standing near the fence on the western side of the yard. The cannibal jammed the point harder against her unprotected throat. The man in front of the fence was big and rangy, with hair and beard that might have been red when it was clean. The long coat and clothes he wore were worn with use, and over his shoulder she could see a wooden handle. The expression on his face made her feel cold inside, and she was glad it wasn't directed at her. He held a flat, bladed object in one hand. She could tell it was the same as the one embedded in the eye of the man who had been holding Cain. Throwing knives. There was another in the belt under his greatcoat, and she could also see something silver in his other hand, but couldn't make it out. Tracy didn't know if he was there to help her or help himself, but she decided to worry about that if he managed to take down the cannibals. Well, 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 what do we have here? The leader asked. Unlock the arrow and step away from the lady. The lead cannibal laughed again. Tracy wasn't sure if it was an act or if he genuinely felt like he was back in control. The point of the arrows scratched her skin as he shook with mirth. Behind them, the cannibal called Joel laughed too, but he didn't sound quite so sure of himself. Oh man, you crack me up, said the leader. This is no lady. She's just a whore who's gonna die if you don't put your hands in the air now. The stranger didn't move. He just stood there. The hand holding the knife rested, relaxed, by his side. He began to whistle a tune. What are you doing? The cannibal screamed and pressed the arrow into the woman's neck. A trickle of blood began to crawl its way down her throat. Sorry, said the stranger, smiling, almost as if he was embarrassed. This whole situation just reminded me of a song by Kenny Rogers. It's called The Gambler, 
I doubt you'd know it, but you'll like the words. You gotta know when to hold them. Know when to fold them. Know when to walk away. And know when to run. The leader was dumbfounded by the singing stranger. So much so that when the stranger threw his knife in a lightning-quick movement, he barely had time to flinch. The heavy blade speared into his hand and knocked it away from the bitch's throat, the arrow falling uselessly to the ground. The cannibal grabbed his skewered hand and backed away as the messenger reached fluidly over his shoulder and drew his axe from its clasp. Still humming the tune, he started swinging the axe one-handed in a cross-shaped pattern, slowly at first, then with ever-increasing velocity. It was only when he brought his other arm up to balance the weight of the axe that she realized his hand was missing, and in its place was a crude metal hook. The stranger didn't hesitate as he walked towards the leader, his axe now a humming blur. Get him! yelled the leader frantically to the one called Joel as he dropped the bow and began trying to pull the blade from his skewered hand. Still looking unsure, but perhaps still more frightened of his leader than the stranger, the cannibal Joel roared and shot to his feet, charging at the stranger, his carving knife held out before him. Tracy scrabbled towards her frightened children, grabbing the shotgun as she went. When she reached them, she fell to her knees, hugging them and frantically beckoning for Cain to join her. The stranger elegantly stepped aside, and the charging cannibal shot past him. The axe never stopped moving. The cannibal pulled up, annoyed that he had been evaded so easily. He turned and brought up the knife, except that he didn't. The knife was gone. In fact, not only his knife, but his arm below the elbow. He looked at the stranger, puzzled as rich red arterial blood pumped from the raw stump of his forearm onto the grass. Sharp, isn't it? The stranger asked agreeably. I bet you didn't even feel that. Don't worry, you'll pass out from loss of blood before it begins to hurt. I wasn't so lucky when I lost my hand. He waved his hook in front of the cannibal's face before the dying man dropped to his knees. As his life seeped from him, he didn't have the strength to protest when the stranger pressed the sole of his boot against his chest and knocked him gently onto his back. With an effort born of desperation, the leader, Logan, pulled the throwing blade from his hand with a short scream of pain and began to stumble towards the woman and her children. He pulled up sharply when she raised the shotgun, pumping it emphatically. He raised his hands and veered away, resigned to facing the stranger. Please, don't kill me. We were just having fun. We weren't going to hurt them. Should I give you the same mercy you showed their father? The messenger asked, the axe suddenly still in his hand, but pointing in the direction of the huddled children. But... The cannibal's pleading face turned to a snarl, and he jerked his hand, throwing the stranger's own knife at him. His aim was true. Unfortunately for him, it hit the stranger with the wrong end and bounced harmlessly to the grass. The stranger looked down at it, then back up at the cannibal, smiling. Phew, nice try, but throwing a knife is really hard unless you've had some practice. Here, let me show you. He dropped the head of the axe to the ground and propped the handle against his thigh before pulling the last blade from his belt. He gripped the blade with his thumb and two forefingers as he held it up. I prefer to hold a blade like this, in a pinch grip. Then you raise your hand like so and bring it up over your shoulder like this. It was at this point the cannibal realized that he was in imminent danger and turned, running for the house. And release. The knife took him in the spine between his shoulder blades. His legs suddenly stopped working, and he crashed into the timber porch face first, before rolling back down the steps to the grass, groaning in shock. He looked up at the stranger, struggling to breathe, his pained eyes still defiant as the man stood over him. Who are you? He rasped. Me? 
Well, they call me the messenger, but my name is Luke. Oh, I have a message for you. Burn in hell. The cannibal saw the axe blade against the overcast sky, and then his vision jerked violently, tumbling before his gaze came to rest on the woodpile at the rear of the yard. He heard the woman's frightened but firm voice. Drop it and put your hands up. Logan Smith tried to turn over, curious why the stranger hadn't killed him yet. He couldn't move, so he turned his eyes as far as he could. He didn't see the man or the woman. What he did see was the stump of his own bloody, pumping neck. His mouth opened in a final, silent scream as the oxygen in his brain was finally exhausted, and death took him. The messenger put his arms in the air, his hook dull in the late afternoon light. His axe was on the ground. He had dropped it when she had ordered it, her shotgun aimed at his belly. Her hands were still trembling from the horror of the last few minutes, and perhaps fear of him. Who are you, mister, and what do you want? My name's Luke, Luke Merritt, and I don't want anything. Rain began to fall in the late afternoon light. First a few sprinkles, then a downpour of heavy, fat drops. The children squealed. He looked up at the dark, heavy sky, smiling, and then back to her. Well, maybe just a roof over my head for the next few hours? Kids, inside, she called, without taking her eyes or gun away from him. They ran inside, eyeing him warily as they passed. All right, Mr. Messenger. I guess it's the least I can do, but if I let you stay a while, she said, nodding at the dead bodies, you can help me clean up this mess before you go on your way. She flinched as he stuck out his good hand. Deal. Strange, as dangerous as he had seemed just minutes ago, there was now something a little childlike about him, something trustworthy. She lowered her gun, ready to bring it up in an instant if he looked like making a threatening move. He didn't. Well, come on in, I guess. Eight. The rain that began falling that day didn't let up for three days. Luke didn't leave for another ten. When he did leave, Tracy Rand and her children went with him. He had told her of the cities, and she knew now exactly why they called him the messenger. He was a gifted storyteller. He related his story, the history of Manchester and the benefits of moving there with a skill that left both her and her children enchanted and sold on the idea of going back with him. Even with his stories and the opportunity the city seemed to offer, she might still have opted to stay and tough it out if it wasn't for one thing, Luke himself. By the end of that ten days, she was falling for him. At first, she felt disgust that so soon after losing Daniel, she could even think about another man, but it seemed beyond her power to control. Luke, for his part, never encouraged or returned her affection, and even when they set out for the city, she had no inkling of whether he had the same feelings for her or not. It didn't matter. She was following a feeling and would see it through to its possibly bitter end. Neither her nor the children looked back as they followed the tall stranger down the hill and over the barricade to their new life. The End hey! You have been listening to Messenger by Scott Medbury, narrated by Adam Barr. If you're enjoying Scott's audiobook content, please like and subscribe. It's the best way to help out the channel.